All right, we're going to go ahead and get started um, for this evening. Uh, welcome to the UGA Special Collections Libraries, and thank you for joining us this evening for the 2023 Congress, Congress Week Lecture featuring Professor Emeritus Lock K. Johnson. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm the Politics and Public Policy Archivist here at the Richard B. Russell Library. And before we begin, I'd like to, to thank a few, several people, really. Uh, first, my, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Kalen Washnock and Jill Severn for helping to plan and coordinate all the logistics for this event. Uh, our co-sponsors from, from SPIA, especially Dean Matthew Auer, Sarah Baines, Caroline Pachowski, Josh Massey, and Bill Zachman. The annual Congress Week Lecture is made possible with financial support from the Russell Library Programming Endowment and the Lamartine G. Hardman III Fund. So we'd like to extend an appreciation to both the Richard B. Russell Foundation, as well as the entire Hardman family. So our guest this evening is no stranger to at the Athens community nor the UGA campus. Locke Johnson is Regents Professor Emeritus of Public and International Affairs at the University of Georgia, where he is also, or was a, is the Josiah Meggs Distinguished Teaching Professor Emeritus. Born in Auckland, New Zealand, he earned his bachelor's degree in political science from the University of California, uh, Davis, and his PhD in political science from the University of California, Riverside. A scholar of national security policy in the intelligence community with more than 30 books and 200 articles and chapters to his name, Professor Johnson began his teaching career with stints at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, California State University, San Francisco, and Ohio University before finally joining the faculty of the University of Georgia in 1979, where he taught until his retirement in 2019. Professor Johnson also enjoyed a career in government service that included time uh, as special assistant to the church committee, special assistant to the ranking minority member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and sen senior staffer on the Subcommittee on Trade and International Economic Policy, as well as staff director of the House Subcommittee on Oversight and Intelligence. He advised the presidential campaigns of Senator Frank Church and Governor Jimmy Carter, and served on the Aspen Brown Commission from 1995 to 1996. Closer to home, he was a member of the Georgia State Board of Elections from 1997 to 2000. Among his numerous awards and honors, Professor Johnson was named the inaugural SEC Professor of the Year in 2012. He received the International Association for Intelligence Education's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015, and of course, the University of Georgia's President's Medal in 2022. The topic of Professor Johnson's lecture tonight is Congress and the Decline of Democracy. Is the legislative branch part of the problem or part of the solution? So without further ado, please join me in welcoming home Professor Locke Johnson. Thank you very much. I um, must um, smile a bit at that word distinguished up there because it reminds me of when I was introduced at Georgetown University a few years ago. There was an international student who gave me an introduction and he was a sweet guy, but his English was a little shaky. And he said, now I present to you the extinguished professor from the university. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit that way now. Actually, I'm so thrilled to be back in Athens that I think I forgot everything I was gonna say tonight. <laughs> Anyway, it's great to be here. And Ashton, thank you for that lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Ashton and I have been involved in some oral histories together and have become very close friends, and I admire his research. Well, obviously, it is a, a high honor for me to speak here tonight as part of Congress Week at, at the Russell Library. I've always been a great fan of Richard Russell when it comes to national security. He really was in a class all of his own back in his day, the go-to expert on matters of, of foreign policy and defense policy. And by the way, if you go back and read about the Vietnam War, which I'm doing a lot of right now, just out of interest in the project I'm working on, you'll find that his voice was one of great reason during that period where he was constantly without much luck I'm trying to convince Johnson that, that was not a good war to be involved in. I'm also a fan of, of this library. I've had the good fortune to teach in this room, 
to do research with colleagues over here at the library. I am close to the people who run this place. Uh, Cheryl Voigt has been a friend of mine for years. We've worked on all kinds of projects. And uh, Toby Graham, who is the director of the main library, as you know, is also a dear friend whom I admire a lot. So for me, in a way, particularly when I look out here and see the faces before me, this is less a, a formal lecture than it is like a homecoming, a family event. So I'm really quite thrilled to be here. I feel very honored. Our country is the longest lasting democracy in history. Though not without its flaws, America's open society has demonstrated a wonderful capacity for adapting, growing, and improving. Who in the 1780s would have dreamed that a black man would be elected president of the United States and that his fiercest competitor would be a woman? Nevertheless, we face multiple challenges to our way of life. My purpose this evening is to address concerns about the future of democracy with a focus on American foreign policy. First though, let me touch on a wider set of problems. On Capitol Hill, our Congress is more diverse than ever in terms of race and gender. This is a good thing in my view, but it has been a high level of turnover and accompanying inexperience. There are 74 new members of the House, none as good as Don used to be, but uh, there they are, and seven new members of the Senate. Many of these members have far right orientations and like those on the far left, many fail to understand that politics is the art of compromise. Thus legislation is achieved only by the narrowest of margins, if at all. Further, as we all know, we have to some extent become a nation of election deniers, as well as targets of social media platforms that rapidly disseminate a flood tide of disinformation about the United States. In addition, President Eisenhower's warning of a powerful military industrial complex in the United States is as pertinent today as it was back in 1961. Our defense budget has soared to record levels, $816 billion most recently, more than all of the other major nations in the world combined. And corporations have become vastly larger, wealthier, more powerful, and more involved in politics than ever before. At the same time, objective journalism has taken a nosedive. A corrosive cynicism flourishes among our citizens. Gun violence continues to massacre our children. And barriers to voting have sprung up across the land, including the presence of armed individuals there to intimidate voters who have come to cast their ballots. Gerrymandering also persists in undermining competitive elections and encouraging a brand of poisonous partisanship. So there are several negative forces at play that are seriously eroding our democracy. Tonight, I offer some observations about foreign, the foreign policy side of these challenges. Here is my thesis. While conducting relations abroad, administrations of both parties have undermined important constitutional checks against the abuse of power in the United States. I will provide 
some examples of this erosion from the recent administrations of George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald J. Trump. The Biden administration is really too recent to have much serious research done on it, so I won't try to come up with a, a full-blown evaluation of what's going on now, but I will offer some preliminary observations. In a dangerous undercurrent gathering strength inside the United States, public officials in Washington often forget the genius of America's constitutional design. This nation was founded in an anti-power ethos as enumerated in the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence against King George III. The Constitution safeguards against a dangerous concentration of power into the hands of one person or one institution was the most important innovation adopted by the founders. Consider the war power. The founders understood that a president surely had to have the ability to protect the country and our citizens abroad in the case of the sudden attack against us. No doubt about that. But they reserved to Congress the power to authorize U.S. involvement in substantial military commitments abroad. This sharing of power was the great insight, the precious gift, really, our forefathers passed down to us. Listen to Justice Brandeis commenting on this, one of my favorite quotes from the annals of American um, legal cases. The doctrine of the separation of powers was adopted in 1787 not to promote efficiency, but to preclude the exercise of arbitrary power. The purpose was not to avoid friction, but by means of the inevitable friction that one would have among three branches of government, and here's a phrase that still makes me tremble a little bit, to save the people from autocracy. That's what that document was all about. Yet too frequently, the presidents and many lawmakers have rejected this prescription for divided power and the involvement of lawmakers in the making of foreign policy. During the Bush to Obama and Trump administrations, our nation has drifted toward a system of government that has often belittled this basic principle of democracy. The trend can be seen in three important instruments of foreign policy the war power, the treaty power, and what I'll term the spy power. And those are the three I wanna look at for each of these three presidents, starting with the war power. Let me say a general word about that first before turning to the actual presidents. In 1787, Madison successfully advocated strong legislative involvement in the use of the war power. War making would be approved by Congress. Yet over the years, a so-called unitary presidency has emerged, which views foreign policy as the sole dominion, the sole area of decision-making for the president. No congressional involvement. In the aftermath of the Second World War, we saw a drift away from Congress making these decisions toward presidents making them. Among the road signs, Truman's claim of inherent powers. When somebody starts talking to you in Washington about having inherent powers, run as fast as you can. Or take LBJ's unilateral escalation of war in Vietnam. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of reading on that now. And the lies that LBJ was telling to us 
while he was building up U.S. troops in Vietnam are astound astounding to realize now. The flawed War Powers Resolution passed in 1973 and dogged by controversy, or shall I say dogged by controversy ever since, with a 60-day clock for reporting to Congress about an entry of this country into military hostilities abroad. Consider, too, President Reagan's unauthorized use of military force in Grenada. What a farce that was. And Libya, Bush one's invasion of Panama, and his pronouncement of inherent presidential authority to defend Kuwait, Clinton's military engagements in Somalia, Iraq, Haiti, and Bosnia without any statutory authorization. Clinton's Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, argued at one point, we're, uh, we're talking about using military force, but we are not talking about a war. That is an important distinction. That is important high-level gobbledygook, I would suggest to you. And later on, the Clinton administration was fond of saying repeatedly that, as far as they were concerned, that they had authority from the United Nations to conduct American military activities abroad if they so saw fit. As if Americans had elected the members of the United Nations. They made that same claim with NATO too. If NATO says we can do it, we can do it. And this is the theory of Congress as a potted plant, I suppose. The treaty power. The constitution requires the Senate to approve treaties by a two thirds vote of those members President voting. However, we have two other forms of agreement making, the statutory agreement, which is a situation which both the House and the Senate approved by majority vote an international pact with another nation. And then we have the most troubling executive agreements where the president or some of his minions will enter into arrangements with other countries with, without any consultation on the Hill whatsoever. And frequently in, in secret, so nobody really knows about it. One example of an executive agreement, LBJ and our own dear, dear Dean Rusk, who I think we all love, um, told Thailand that we would defend it to the bitter end. Now, maybe we would have, but they had no right to secretly promise Thailand that we would come to their defense. Thailand was a member of CETO, of course, but that if you read the language of that treaty, that's a decision Congress would make according to the rules of CETO and for that matter, NATO. The spy power. Espionage is nowhere mentioned in the constitution. No surprise, I guess. This is a matter that was expected to be carried out beyond the normal channels of the government. Under this notion of intelligence exceptionalism, spy operations, including secret wars abroad, and we've had many of them, became a policy isolated within the parameters of the executive branch. That changed dramatically in 1974 when we found in the New York Times articles about how the CIA was spying on American citizens in an operation known as chaos. These were just young students who were against the war in Vietnam. And that really shook people up. The reporting was done by Cy Hirsch, who since then has come and gone off the deep end, I think, but that was brilliant reporting at the time. He's also the one who reported on the My Lai massacre. So this had a ripple effect across the country and people began to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this shouldn't be intelligence exceptionalism. Maybe that part of government should be brought into the Madisonian framework of checks and balances too. Maybe concentrated power in the intelligence world, especially secret concentrated power, was something that ought to be particularly watched closely. Based on recommendations from the church committee, and I was Frank Church's top aide at the time, Congress enacted laws and and created permanent intelligence oversight committees, talking about 1975-76, to guard against future Operation Chaos and, and similar operations that we discovered. We discovered the most horrendous activities by these agencies. The FBI not only spying on 
civil rights activists and anti-Vietnam War protesters, but destroying or trying to destroy their lives by campaigns of innuendo and secret letters and all kinds of things. So, and the NSA, the Electronic Listening Device Agency was also wiretapping people right and left without a proper authority. <coughs> what has been our experiences with these three powers, war, treaty, and spy, spying, during the administrations I mentioned? Each of those three presidents, I would argue, fell far short of an adherence to the institutional sharing of national security powers as mandated by the Constitution. Let's take a look at Bush too, war power. George W. Bush's father was a keen supporter of the idea that presidents had inherent powers to take the nation to war. That if you read Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, by the way, I got to know Sam Irving a little bit, and he taught me a little thing that I always honor. Here's a copy of the Constitution right over my heart. Here it is. <clears throat> so Bush argued, you may recall, at the time of his invasion into Iraq in 1990, that not only did he have inherent powers, but that the United Nations gave him authority. So here again, we see a president relying on the United Nations or NATO or some external organization for um, the right to take America into war. When lawmakers led by our own Sam Nunn rose up against this notion and tried to remind Bush number one of his constitutional responsibilities, uh, Bush finally said, okay, I'll come up to the Hill and make my case. And he did make his case and he made it reasonably well and, and got the approval he sought, although barely in the Senate because the senators were so unhappy with his initial approach. His son, George W. Bush, also embraced the idea of a robust Article II interpretation in favor of presidential power. But learning from his father's um, mistakes, and his run-in with Sam Nunn, Bush number two went up to Congress for support, to find support for his war against also again Iraq in 2003. <laughs> Bush number two though taught us another lesson about presidential war-making power. Even when you have a president who, in this case, Bush number two, was prepared to go up to the hill and make his case, and follow the constitutional procedure, he so frightened members of Congress and the American public that Congress acquiesced. Uh, let me take you back in time to those days where President George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and others in his cabinet were talking about mushroom clouds appearing in our backyards because Saddam Hussein somehow is going to have these nuclear weapons come across the Atlantic Ocean and strike us, strike our communities across the, the nation. Never mind that the CIA and other agencies told the Bush II administration time and time again that Saddam Hussein had no such capabilities. So even when a president may follow procedures properly, a false sense of immediate peril that is pushed along by press releases from the White House can lead to the acquiescence I've referred to. So Congress gave Bush faithfully, and what I would argue was the greatest error of his administration. And let me pat him on the back immediately for his work against AIDS and HIV in Africa, which saved maybe 25 million lives, we now know. So I mean, Bush, too has done some great things, but in this case, I think that he uh, really pulled one over on the American people, much to his discredit and to our own. He was given by Congress something called AUMF, A-U-M-F, which stands for the Authorization of the Use of Military Force. So Congress caved in. The treaty power under Bush II. Bush II also res resorted freely to executive agreements. 
as a way of avoiding debate in the Senate over treaties. For example, through secret lobbying and deal making, he fashioned an anti-Iraqi coalition of various nations around the world that one prominent senator said was comprised of the bribed, the coerced, the bought, and the extorted. With the White House involved in secret diplomacy overseas, Congress had no idea who was joining the war coalition and what the hidden costs were for the United States. <coughs> Spy power. In the wake of 9-11, the second Bush administration bypassed the established warrant procedures for electronic surveillance, procedures set up by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. Here's what a compliant National Security Agency director said to his staff when he returned from the Oval Office to that mammoth organization. I'm quoting, the president is going to do this on his own hook. Raw Article 2, Commander-in-Chief stuff. That was what the NSA director reported. And his top lawyer said, yes, and that's the way it ought to be. So. Even some of the attorneys in the intelligence community thought that the president had the right to do whatever he wanted when it came to these intelligence agencies. Further, Bush number two then claimed in the State of the Union address that Iraq had accumulated tons of yellow cake uranium. Even though the CIA had told him this was not true at all. Furthermore, unbeknownst to lawmakers, the Bush administration turned away all dissents about the weapons of mass destruction hypothesis and how dangerous Iraq was. And there were a number of top analysts in, in the intelligence community who were trying to say, hey, wait a minute, none of this is true. Now, the reasons we went to war in Iraq are complicated, but uh, I think all those people at the top level knew it wasn't because of weapons of mass destruction, but that was a handy argument to make at the time. They had other reasons. The most important one I would argue is to, well, some of them delusionally thought they could turn Iraq into a democracy overnight. Good luck with that. Democracies don't spring forward so easily. And then there were a number of neoconservatives who thought Iraq was a threat to Israel and they wanted to dismantle that threat. Little to do, if any, with the WMDs in Iraq. Obama, war powers. Without any new specific authorization for using military force abroad, Obama relied on UMF, the old Bush II authorization related to Iraq, and used that authorization, absurdly, I would argue, to conduct military engagements in. Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Somalia. Listen to the Yale Law School professor, Bruce Ackerman, on this point. Now I'm quoting him. Nothing attempted by his predecessor, George W. Bush, remotely compares in imperial hubris to Obama's use of military force without congressional debate or approval. Now, part of the problem for Obama was the political gridlock on Capitol Hill. The use of, uh, the, the New York Times observed at the time that <clears throat> legislative paralysis only reinforced the executive branch inclination to stretch the law. The treaty powers, the Obama nuclear pact with Iran that we all know about, was first crafted, if you can imagine, as an executive agreement, something the president was going to do all by himself, until Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, whose daughter was a student of mine right here at this campus, said, now, wait a minute. This isn't the way the Constitution says things should be done. We need to give Congress a chance to review the deal. Corker insisted 
on both House and Senate approval of the negotiating language. Very bold position, although one in harmony, I would say, with the Constitution. Here's what he said. The lack of a congressional vote on this would be a direct affront to the American people and would undermine Congress's appropriate role. Lawmakers approve new language after a lot of weeks of work. And Obama took this new language forward to negotiate the pact with Iran. It was just a brilliant example, I think, of Congress and the presidency working well together on foreign policy. Obama and the spy powers. Obama had minimal interest in working with the spy agencies. Or, for that matter, um, with, with Congress on intelligence matters. He refused to provide thousands of relevant executive branch documents to help the Senate investigation into the subject of torture. He simply turned them down right and left. Now, the investigators, including Don Johnson's son, who was involved in some of this important work, were able to get him these documents nonetheless, or at least many of them, and were able to lay out very clearly and in detail the extent of torture by the CIA. It was horrifying. Now, Obama refused to allow the full report to be released, but he did finally give in to Dianne Feinstein, who was the chair of this committee, and said, okay, we'll allow an executive summary to be released, which was really, even though thin, quite revealing and led to the, the Congress passing important legislation to ban torture by the United States. Senator McCain was important in that whole effort. During this whole period, Barack Obama never even bothered to talk to Dianne Feinstein, fellow Democrat, about the findings of her really amazingly thorough investigation. And a senior CIA official who had destroyed evidence about torture, which is against the law to destroy evidence that might be important in an investigation, was never punished by the Obama administration. Now let's turn to the Trump administration for a moment, the war power. President Trump also relied, if you can imagine, on Bush II era authorization for um, conduct of military affairs during his period. He seemed to think the president enjoyed a blank check when it came to the use of the war power. He also single-handedly set off a new arms race with Russia by announcing without any dialogue with Congress, a whole new set of nuclear weapons that his administration was going to produce. Miniature nuclear weapons that could be uh, used on the battlefield or get this, even against people involved in cyber attacking the United States. Oh, you're cyber attacking me? Take this nuclear weapon, boom. I mean, uh, but, but my point here is that all of this was done, not with the dialogue as the Constitution envisioned, but single-handedly by President Trump. The treaty power. Trump, dem Trump demonstrated how a president can be as powerful reinterpreting existing international treaties or abandoning them altogether as he or one day she can be in using executive agreements from scratch. He balked at honoring Obama's New START treaty with Moscow, designed to scale back nuclear weaponry, calling it, quote, just another bad deal, unquote. He also, as you all remember, abandoned the Paris Climate Accords in 2017, which had been six years in the making and had been signed by 195 other countries. Spy power. No president has ever played so fast and so loose with the nation's intelligence agencies as President Trump. He refused CIA briefings during the 2016 presidential campaign. 
and once in office, sharply limited his contact with any intelligence officers. He selected Mike Pompeo, the most extreme member of the Tea Party in the House of Representatives, to be a CIA director, which traditionally is an office that was nonpartisan in nature. He explicitly, and you'll remember this, compared the CIA and the FBI to none other than Adolf Hitler's Gestapo because of so-called leaks from them, unproven leaks, about the ties he and his staff had to Russian intelligence officers during the 2016 campaign. Trump also advocated a return to the use of CIA waterboarding, or as he put it, even worse form of torture. Moreover, he ordered the assassination by drone of a high-ranking Iranian official, Soleimani. You may remember that case. Uh, you know, you, you, you do things like that who invite retaliation against America's own leaders. So even on a practical level, it's not a good idea. On a moral level, well, it's a whole different question. It's horrendous, I think. Uh, but furthermore, he is required by law to provide reports in advance for a major covert action like that to the Senate and the House Intelligence Committees. That's, that's a 1980 Intelligence Oversight Act. Never did it. That's what got Reagan into so much trouble when he avoided those committees and said, oh, well, we don't need to talk to them during the Iran-Contra scandal. A couple of observations about Biden. Biden has been careful, I think, to seek authority from lawmakers for military and intelligence assistance to the brave people of Ukraine. Further, this administration has been cooperative with congressional inquiries into the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. Congress has recently reported on how pathetic, how poorly that evacuation was handled. And I, I was also dismayed about Biden's role in that, but at least I was happy to see that he was willing to cooperate with congressional investigators and help them come to the bottom of what happened. The treaty power under Biden, Biden, uh, a veteran of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and well aware of all the times the presidents have tried to bypass that important panel, has avoided the use of executive agreements for any significant foreign policy initiatives. The spy power, Biden has taken a lively interest in intelligence. He understands the decision advantage that America's intelligence agencies can provide a president. And he taps into that wellspring of knowledge in world events. Uh, one questionable move that I would point to is, is his decision to work with the Senate and House Intelligence Committee chairman and, and um, ranking minority member in both chambers. <clears throat> but the law says he also needs to work with the full panels, both the House and Senate Intelligence Committee, to go into the details of why he had those documents at his house and his office. And so, so he gets some high marks, I think, for at least working with the leadership of those committees, but he ought to take a look at that law and realize he needs to brief the full membership of both panels. That's, that's important, I think. Spy power. Um, so I, I think he deserves reasonably high marks in that area. Let me turn to a conclusion. For the Bush to Obama and Trump administrations, the exercise of presidential hubris was most evident with the war and spy powers. But as well, these presidents skirted, or at least tried to skirt, involvement of lawmakers in international agreement making as well. Even relying on executive agreements for important matters. Bush too and Trump had their executive aggrandizement tied to the notion of a unitary presidency. They really believe that philosophically. What historian author Schlesinger referred to more vividly as the phrase all of you remember, the imperial presidency. Even the Harvard trained lawyer, Barack Obama, ended up in this camp, although sometimes more by necessity when a polarized Congress 
made a policy partnership between the executive and legislative branches difficult to pull off. Still, while Obama's rhetoric bent at times toward James Madison, his actions remained more in the camp of Article II devotees. What would a return to constitutional principles have meant during the periods that I'm talking about, these three administrations? It would have required fealty to the Constitution's basic requirement of power sharing between Congress and the White House. With respect to the war power, Obama and Trump would have been willing to seek specific authorizations for the use of military force that they wanted to engage in, rather than relying on the old authorization that Bush too had for Iraq. Lawmakers, all too complacent during this period, should have demanded that as well. With the treaty power, these presidents would have turned to the Senate treaty procedure for measures of great importance, such as Obama's nuclear deal. Should a two-thirds vote in the United States Senate prove impossible? Then so be it. If a presidential initiative cannot attract the support that the Constitution has required, then a policy initiative probably should not be pursued. Moreover, only with low level routine matters should these three presidents have resorted to the use of executive agreements. With the spy power, these presidents should have all consistently reported to the two intelligence committees. How can Congress be an equal branch of government in the conduct of American foreign policy without access to vital information about threats to the United States? Well, the answer is obvious, it can't. With respect to constitutional procedure in American foreign policy, what direction will the United States be taking in the next uh, few years? An embrace of the Madisonian model of shared powers, which if you take a look has been widely honored throughout the history of this country till more recently, or will the advocates of a unitary presidency hold sway? allowing presidents to become ever more imperial, perhaps even adopting open-ended emergency decrees. Now, some may scoff at this possibility in the United States, but consider the Roman Empire for a moment. Since we're here at a university, let's get uh, historical. The Caesars, did not spring from the brow of Zeus. Subtly, insidiously, they stole their powers away from an unsuspecting Senate. Or recall how quickly democracy crumbled in the Weimar Republic. The moment Hitler used emergency decrees to defend the Reich against alleged rabble rousers. A reckless coalition government in the Reichstag handed to the Nazis full authority over war making and treaty making, over budgets and lawmaking, and most faithfully, over Hitler's spy apparatus, the Gestapo. Today, in a time of anti-American rhetoric coming from Putin and other autocrats around the world, much of it slipped into the multi-social media channels that we all face with some trepidation. Democratic institutions have, be, have come under increasing 
stress. In his magisterial study of the Roman Empire, which I'm sure many in this room have read, the British historian Edward Gibbons cautioned that, let me quote him, constitutional assemblies form the only balance capable of preserving a free constitution against enterprises of an aspiring prince. Or, and Steve will remember this case, the steel seizure case of 1952, Justice Jackson saying, with all of its defects, delays, and inconveniences, we have discovered no technique for long preserving free government, except that the executive be under the law and that law be made by parliamentary deliberations. America's founders understood this core principle. They knew it was important to have a strong Congress that could pose difficult questions to officials in the executive branch that could help determine budgets, that could humble generals, admirals, and even presidents. Whether we in future generations will continue to honor this principle is a matter of ongoing debate. The possibility of an imperial presidency always hovers near. Indeed, from time to time, and increasingly so in recent years, this dangerous philosophy has dominated the White House and even captured the thinking of several members of Congress. The very institution created by the founders to guard against the accumulation of power into the hands of a president. Now, do I have any good news for you? <laughs> and the answer is yes, I do. Uh, many officials today, as well as the general public, are coming to remember the importance of a balanced government. Listen, for example, to Bob Gates, who's been on this campus many times, former CIA director, former president of the Boy Scouts, many other things, um, a Republican, former Secretary of Defense. Here's, here's what he had to say about a balanced government. Some awfully crazy schemes might well have been approved had everyone present in the White House not known and expected hard questions, debate, and criticism from the Hill. And when on a few occasions Congress was kept in the dark and such schemes did proceed, it was almost always to the lasting regret of the president involved. Well, just two weeks ago, and I'm sure you saw this in the papers, a strong bipartisan, remember that word bipartisan? It does exist every now and then. A strong bipartisan group on Capitol Hill voted in the Senate to eliminate that oomph, that authorization from the Bush II era. And that's a step in the right direction. Now it's going to go to the House and even Speaker McCarthy has said that he's going to support it. And President Biden has said he will sign it. So there's a movement on the Hill to restore these eroded powers. And it uh, cuts across party lines. Nevertheless, these are my final words. It is going to take a commitment that is ongoing in Washington and among us, the public to ensure the survival of our constitutional way of life. Here's one of my favorite journalists, Bill Moynihan. Democracy in America is a series of narrow escapes and we may be running out of time. I feel in my heart the poignancy of that comment as we gather here tonight. We must do all we can to help rein in the reckless use of the war 
treaty and spy powers, as well as address the other challenges that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks. Or else, our noble experiment in democracy will vanish. What will take its place? Exactly what the founders feared the most, autocratic rule by an untethered president. This we cannot let happen. We will not let government of the people, by the people, and for the people perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Locke, for that that talk. And, and um, I would say it was inspiring, but it definitely um, inspires me uh, to to <laughs> think more uh, to think more deeply about the issues. Uh, confronting us now and and possibly again in the future. Um, I know we've got food outside, but first, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, we want to take a few questions uh, from the audience, and I'll and I'll use my my point of personal privilege to ask the the, the first question, which is, Locke, that you're you're talking about you know the Madisonian theory of of government, and, and even going back to Edward Gibbon. And you've talked a bit about polarization in Congress and how that feeds into the, the imperial presidency or the unitary theory of the presidency. Do, does, do those theories require good faith governing partners in the legislative branch? And is that something that is of growing concern as you are a veteran of bipartisan um, Congressional committees, Senate and House. Um, our last uh, Congress Week lecturer was Representative Adam Kinzinger from the the January sixth committee, uh, potentially one of the last truly bipartisan select committees that we may see in the near future. So, what what is your take on the role of good faith governing partners of opposite parties, and whether? those theories of shared governance and checks and balances can survive with or without good faith partners. Well, thank you, Ashton. You know, I think uh, Ashton, Ashton has really put his finger on an important point. And without what he's talking about, this shared understanding and shared uh, working together and sympathy for one another and a realization, as Bismarck put it, that politics is the art of compromise. But democracy doesn't have much of a chance. Democracy is actually rather fragile, as we all know, and it has to be treated delicately, and there's got to be some common ground. I have this wonderful collection in my um, archives of photographs about politics, and there's a birthday cake on a table, and there's a hand with a knife, and it's cutting the birthday cake, and there's another hand on top of that one. And the first hand is Lyndon Johnson, and the birthday cake is about celebrate, celebrating an anniversary on Capitol Hill. And the second hand is Everett Dirksen. And here they were cutting this cake together and they were the same way. I mean, they would vote often in different ways as Donald, you wouldn't remember, but you've read about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, after debating as best they could, they would then go have a bourbon together. And you've got, sort of got to have that atmosphere. And we used to have it. You know, I hate to say this about a fellow Georgian, but I tend to put blame on Newt Gingrich. He went to Washington with this kind of combative at, attitude. And I must say, I guess over the short term, it paid off for him. The Republicans did win a majority in the House. But at what cost? And what kind of attitude was that? So. I think we all know, but we've got to make sure this happens. We have to return to an era when we respect one another, even if we may disagree on the issues. 
So Ashton, thanks for asking that. It's central to what we're talking about. Yes. Uh, just following up a little bit on that, what is your advice to a legislator who just got selected, being sent to Washington, knowing that if he does compromise on almost any issue, he's going to be primary because he's made the wrong choice? It seems to me that you can almost make an argument that it's too much democracy because we used to be able to negotiate and, and compromise. Now they can't make one wrong vote, or they're going to get thrown out of office. Well, I would say that first of all, they need to mobilize their own supporters better. They need to spend more time back home nurturing those people who do believe in them. And secondly, I would say, do the right thing, stand up for what you believe in, and suffer the consequences, whatever they might be. And I think people admire, over the long haul at least, people who take that position. You read John Kennedy's profile in Courage. It's a series of chapters about people who had tough choices like that, knowing they might go down in flames in the next election, and they stood for their convictions. I think Edmund Burke had a right back in 1776. How do I remember that day? It's just one of those dates you remember. And Edmund Burke uh, wrote an essay in which he said, you know, members of parliament owe their allegiance not to Bristol, which was the name of his district. And what they really owe their allegiance to is England and doing the right thing for the country. And if we had that mentality among our lawmakers, we'd be a lot better off. I know it's not easy to do. And what often comes first is how can I get reelection, be elected? Part of it is, is almost depressing to think about because We've got to get big money out of politics so that normal people can run for office. I mean, it, it's frightening to think of the way the corporations have taken over these elections. But I think there are people out there, one thinks of Proxmire of Wisconsin, who paid, what was it, $54 for his filing fee, spent no other money in any of his elections, and got elected time and time again. How did that happen, even in Wisconsin, which is a purple state? It happened because people admired his conviction and his sense of independence. Yes. Thank you. Well, that's a great question again, right at the, yeah, the, the, the question was what can the layperson, what can you and I do to make America democracy more vibrant and to make it help it work. I'm just thrilled, Matt Auer, the wonderful Dean of School of Public and International Affairs and a good friend of mine. Matt, I'm, th I'm thrilled by the activities of young people in Chicago recently, electing the mayor up there and the Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin. According to reporting in the Times and other newspapers, those two campaigns, which were upsets, were fueled by young student voters who got involved. So voting is absolutely paramount and we need to remind ourselves how important it is, but we also need to, if we can possibly find the time, go that extra step and, and help with elections as well. One of the things I admired about Dean Rusk is that every election day we ever had around here, he'd get in his car even when he was quite old uh, and drive people to the polls. Remember that Gary? Uh, that's a kind of, we can help that way. We can, we can get energized about certain candidates or, or run for office ourselves. And, and you know, when I look at the, the resumes of students in SPIA and <clears throat> other majors across campus, what, what was I doing in college? I only had one major. These people have three. I belong to one organization. They belong to 12. So we've got a very talented group of young people coming up and some of them are going to be fabulous candidates. And some of them believe that one should vote one's con convictions and not just put your finger up in the air. Yes. Yes, and then to fold into what you said, think of the, the deep fakes and all the, the manipulation of social media is making it even more difficult. Oh, yeah. Let me ask you a brief question, if I may. What do you think of the notion of a centrist party? The notion being most American voters are probably moderates. Why can't we have a centrist party? It doesn't seem to have worked. Well, 
These are terrific observations. Thank you. And hello to John Maltese. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, there are a lot of moving parts here that need to be fixed, but gerrymandering is one of them. And I recommend to you the research and writing of Charles Bullock, a colleague of mine uh, in the political science department. There are states now, and I think Nebraska is one of them, who are using computers to more honestly draw these lines without a lot of bias involved. And we've got to go that route. Again, though, as, as you point out, it's kind of frustrating to know how to change things, but it takes such an individual initiative and then joining with neighbors and friends to bring some, some influence to bear. And having been around politics much of my life, I'm always impressed at how open politicians are to interest group influence, to people like you and others who have gathered together and traveled to Washington to make a point. They listen, not all of them, but many of them do. So I think a lot of it depends on organization. Maybe that's the way it should be. Maybe we should um, expect in a democracy for the citizens to be activists and involved. You all are, I know. I know many of you, and I know how involved you are. But where are the students tonight, I, I would like to know. That, <laughs> I find that troubling. I don't take it personally, but <laughs> I do find it troubling. Well, Locke, I, I, what I wanted to say is, is, in addition to food being outside, we also have copies of Locke's latest book um, for sale. And I'm sure if you slip him uh, a 20, he'll sign it for you uh, free of charge. Um, so thank you, Locke, very much. And, and join us out in the, the exhibition hall for food and conversation and some, some books. <laughs>